The last page has been turned on my most recent read and until this morning when I sat down to write, I had every intention of talking about it, trust me. Next week, definitely. The book I'm going to be talking about today is one that I finished earlier in the week and one that I was honestly surprised by, especially given my recent experience with this particular series. So yes, it is one of a series and a series that I have talked about a few times on this show. So here I am, no spoilers, as opinion filled as ever and ready to roll. All of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. Join me today as I again visit the charming village of Carsley in the Cotswolds and re-meet Agatha Raisin and her crew of investigators to look into a mysterious death in the latest novel by M.C. Beaton and R.W. Green, Agatha Raisin, Dead on Target. I'm your host, Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer, and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to-be-read pile, though it's shrinking right at this moment, and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. As I have already mentioned, this book was not originally going to be the topic of discussion for today. I finished a relatively new historical romance novel just yesterday evening, and until I sat down to put together notes for this recording, it was A Lady's Guide to Fortune Hunting by Sophie Irwin that was going to be the topic for discussion. However, after a very odd dream, and the realisation that I am not quite done with the wonderful Agatha, here we are. A visit to the local village fate for a spot of fun and relaxation turns into a nightmare for Agatha Raisin when she discovers the body of the local landowner in the woods with an arrow in his chest and trousers around his ankles. Agatha's old adversary, Detective Chief Inspector Wilkes, declares the death a tragic accident, believing the victim has been hit by a stray arrow from an archery demonstration. Agatha is convinced of foul play, however, and is shocked when Wilkes eventually agrees with her as his prime murder suspect. Determined to clear her name and find the real killer, Agatha launches her own investigation, quickly becoming involved with a family at war, an unscrupulous gangster and a killer who is determined to make her the next victim. When a book starts with the line, I'll kill him, I swear I will, we can't let him get away with this, you just know that someone, by the end of probably the second chapter, is going to end up dead. Of course, initially you don't know who this character is talking about and you don't even get to find out who is being witnessed having this attack of possibly necessary anger, just that she has long blonde hair. Agatha Raisin doesn't think much of it when she witnesses this display of temper in a car park as she is headed to the Carsley Village fate with her friend Margaret Bloxby. It turns out that the couple having a disagreement in the car park are married, Stephanie and Gerald Pride, the son and daughter-in-law of a wealthy landowner, Sir Godfrey, who has a bit of a roving eye and definite wandering hand. Whatever reason, Stephanie is clearly incredibly angry, but the source of this anger could be anyone, at least at this point. At the fate, the Ancombe Archers Club is displaying their skills. They were set up by Sir Godfrey to help the disadvantaged find focus, as well as present a positive side to his character. At least, this is my guess. While wandering around the fate, taking in the sights, Charles introduces Agatha to Godfrey, who requests her help. Intent on enjoying herself and taking a bit of a break, she gives him her business card and asks him to call and set up an appointment, which he agrees to. Unfortunately for poor Sir Godfrey, and thanks to the mischief of a golden retriever puppy who went missing and ran away from their owner, the ageing Lothario's body is discovered by Agatha, trousers round his ankles and an arrow through his chest. He is still alive for moments before he breathes his last. 
As the last person to see Sir Godfrey alive, Agatha has no choice but to wait for the police. And when DCI Wilkes arrives, she is not exactly surprised to discover that the somewhat incompetent but absolutely competitive detective believes Agatha to be his prime suspect. At least once he realises and acknowledges she is right and it is a murder. Her business card was in the victim's pocket. She had been seen to be shooting an arrow, albeit incredibly badly, and she was the one who found the body. Wilkes shows his hand so often when it comes to Agatha, he he doesn't like her and is therefore always doing his best to make sure she is not only kept out of the way, but also tries to discredit her and her abilities early on in his investigations. As a suspect, Agatha is determined to prove her innocence because she knows she did not commit the crime. What motive did she have? And furthermore, knows that Godfrey wanted to hire her to find out something. Was this investigation to do with whatever caused his death? With no time to waste, Agatha sets about trying to find out more about Sir Godfrey and what she discovers leads her into danger that she has been warned multiple times by many people to stay away from, but she can't help it. Of course, she cannot carry out this investigation on her own, and with a staff of competent investigators at her fingertips, she doesn't have to. No Agatha Raisin book would be complete, at least as far as I'm concerned, without an appearance from the wonderful Roy Silver. I admit that he is probably one of my favourite characters in the TV show, but he also holds a place in my heart in the books. He's managed to get himself in something of a dangerous pickle and arrives in Castley to get advice and support from Agatha and somehow his task, negotiating with the Pride family on behalf of a rather nasty and questionably moral character, puts him dead centre in Agatha's investigation of Sir Godfrey's death. The man that Roy is working for is on the questionable side of legal, and it's possible he would do anything in order to get what he wants, which in this case happens to be Sir Godfrey's home. This book has it all, from blackmail and infidelity, secret meetings, intimidating business dealings, and very unhappy, warring children. Whatever front Sir Godfrey put on for the public, behind closed doors he did enough rather unlikable things that there are no shortage of motives for his murder. So Agatha and her fellow detectives have got a lot of work to do in order to get to the bottom of the mystery and put the real killer not Agatha, behind bars before Wilkes gets into his head to do something extreme and actually arrest Agatha for a crime she did not commit again. Poor Agatha, though. While it seems as though she has finally got things in her messy and far too complicated love life all sorted out, courtesy of a police officer, John, she is happy in her relationship with him, but nothing is as it appears. James has just got to show up, of course, and try and put a spanner in the works. Through Charles, she discovers that James is back in Castley and is in hospital for treatment for his cancer, for it has returned. But is all what it appears to be. I'm going to give absolutely nothing away, so we're going to stop here with the summary of the book because otherwise I might actually reveal who the murderer is and I do not want to but I am going to say that there is no cliffhanger. You will be relieved to hear that. As with many of the books that I have reviewed of late, this one is rather new. In fact, it was published on the 19th of September this year. Given that, and the fact that Agatha tends to be for slightly older readers, at least as far as the books appear to be concerned... The number of reviews available was much lower than for fantasy and science fiction novels, which I have been looking at quite often in the last few months. Not that I let this influence me in either way. I have to come clean here, though, and say that I did not buy this book. No, I didn't borrow it from the library. My library has a waiting list a mile long for pretty much anything new. It was one I was very happy to receive an arc for, courtesy of NetGalley, and the publishers. 
So thank you very much for that. When it comes to Agatha Raisin, I am not a go out and buy it right away person. I am far more of a pick this up later in paperback kind of person. On this occasion, it was more a get an e-proof and I am happy that it was. Sometimes it's nice to read something ahead of others, though in this instance, I was actually reading it slightly after it had been published because I was a little late to reading it. Yeah, I have to say that given my experience with some of the later books in the Agatha Rayson series, I wasn't sure what to expect. And we will get into that when I do my full review a little bit later on. I didn't really have time to ponder the reading timeline with this one as I was on a bit of a tight deadline and I really did want to read this before it was archived on the 21st of September, though I didn't actually get approval for it until mid-September anyway. I didn't check any spoilers and didn't look at reviews. I just switched on my Kindle and got reading because I really was on a tight deadline. I am not a fan of reading to a deadline, as you will know, but this book was one of the shorter ones I've picked up of late at just 256 pages. Yes, it was a third of the length of the last book I finished, and that made it something of a breeze to get through. It made it far more enjoyable, to be honest. I think had it been any longer, the book would have been too long for this particular plot. As a regular Agatha Raisin reader, I had a good idea of what to expect. Despite the victims and the motives, and often the background stories being different every time, there is a sort of rhythm to the way that the stories are told, so each book has a familiar feel to it. It's like being wrapped up in your favourite cosy blanket while sipping on hot chocolate, and that's what I love about these books. Though I don't think that this sort of book requires trigger warnings exactly, everyone has different needs and different histories. And of course, if you want to ensure you aren't stepping into an emotional minefield, then it could be that checking existing reviews would be the sensible move for you as an individual. Just avoid the spoiler-filled ones that make reading a murder mystery completely unnecessary because would you really want to find out the twist in the plot before it happens? Personally, I didn't bother checking reviews for this book until I was starting to put together this episode, partly because I wanted to avoid any chance of discovering the motive and the killer, but also because I was on this tight deadline and I really did read this book in one sitting. I think it took me a couple of hours and I guess that's really the advantage of a shorter book. Reviews in any situation really prove how different everybody is. What is one person's favourite book of all time will be another's most disliked. While one person will fall in love with a specific character, another will wish that they disappeared into a dark abyss. It can be quite entertaining to read through reviews and discover what other people loved and hated about a book, and then find that the next review is the complete opposite. For every lover of a classic, there's a detractor, and who's to say whose opinion is right or wrong? As always, I want to give you a balanced perspective because hearing views from both ends of the spectrum is important and helps you to get a, a better idea of what you're heading into. Sure, I may not share these views and they might have found something entirely different in the book when they read it, but that doesn't make their opinion or mine any less valid. This is how they felt about it. Of course, as I always say, don't let any of these reviews, including mine, sway you. If the book doesn't appeal, don't read it. If it does, give it a go. Pam Wright didn't enjoy this addition to the Agatha Raisin series as much as previous installments, so she gave the book two stars and said, I always look forward to the latest Agatha Raisin. They are my guilty pleasure, so thank you very much for the arc. This book is what fans will expect and know well. The certain cut-and-paste type of writing, the outrageous fun plot and characters, the same plot points, format, style, and Agatha being a bit of a pain in the bum, but nonetheless likeable. However, that being... 
this is one of the poorer books in the series. You can really tell it's written by a different author. There are all the usual MC traits, but they're muddled in with the new writer's traits. I found there was a sense of the ever-growing wokeness, PC rules thrown in, but then contrasts, there were some of the usual not very PC humdingers. It becomes too much of one extreme to another, making for confusing reading. I feel the full book lacked any punch. It was lazily written with very little subplot or background character development, and Agatha wasn't Agatha. It's a real shame I can't say this was any pleasure to read at all, never mind a guilty one. I think it would be good to retire Agatha now. She's had a good innings. Fans will buy it for sure, but they might not get the usual Agatha bang for their buck. Any new readers will wonder why the series is so popular. Not the best at all. I'll still read the next instalment purely because my nose would bother me. Pam wasn't alone in thinking that perhaps it is time to hang up Agatha's hat. And as someone who was the first to say, what are they doing when the Andrews estate hired a ghostwriter to continue making money from Virginia Andrews' creations, maybe I should also be there. Those who rate the book lower seemed to be of the mind that the only person who can write Agatha is MC Beaton. And that's a fair assumption given she created the character and her friends and she was the one who made us love her just as she is. R.W. Green, who wrote this book using Beaton's creations, gifted us with a detailed introduction in this book. I believe that this may be the first one he has written without Beaton at his side and he started to write with Beaton when she first sadly became ill. In his introduction, he gives us some insight into the teachings he received when first writing Agatha and how much he has come to appreciate her. That Beaton remains the headline and Green is the byline says to me that he knows which side his bread is buttered and will do everything he can to respect not only Beaton's creation, but the readers who have made Agatha Raisin as popular as she is. But perhaps that's just my interpretation. I mean, everyone has one. It's very difficult to determine the opinion of the masses when the number of reviews is still rather low. However, I need to not compare this number with the figures we see whenever a brand new fantasy novel is released. Seriously, the review numbers on those is unbelievable. Agatha Raisin, Dead on Target, currently has a really good overall rating of 4.18, which is, I think, pretty impressive. The number of reviews is still rather low, but I guess it depends on what you're comparing this figure to. It has 392 ratings and 150 full reviews. A whopping 80% of those reviews and ratings, which works out at a total of 316, are four and five stars. While there are no one-star opinions, just 11 two-star ratings, and only 65 readers felt it was a middle-of-the-road book. While taking a look through the novel, I didn't see anyone who had abandoned it at any point. But I think that this has more to do with the length of the tale than anything else. Sometimes a shorter book has advantages over its long companions in that people don't seem to give up on them as often. A longer novel requires a lot more time investment, as I have discovered to my detriment many times. And that way people who are struggling are more likely to abandon something long that they aren't enjoying. She Read Book Blog gave the book five stars and seemed happy to do so. In her review, she said, This is the 34th in the series. It is the first I have read. I think it worked well as a standalone. The creator of the Agatha Raisin series, M.C. Beaton, has passed away, but the baton of continuing the series has been taken up by R.W. Green, who was a friend and collaborator with Beaton. In this instalment, Agatha, attending a town fair, discovers the body of a local landowner who only moments earlier had told her he wanted to discuss something with her. Was it an accident as the result of an archery exhibition that was part of the fair, or was it murder? Her nemesis, DCI Wilkes, wants to charge Agatha with the crime. Of course, despite being warned away by Wilkes, Agatha investigates. There are a number of suspects with nefarious motives. There is also romance for Agatha, but with which one of her suitors? 
Agatha is quite the character, middle-aged, competent, humorous, straightforward, and quite vain. The story was an entertaining, engrossing, fast read. I enjoyed meeting the various colourful characters who inhabit the Cotswolds town of Carsley. There are many Agatha Raisin fans out there. If you enjoy cosy mysteries with characters who are a force to be reckoned with and haven't met her yet, I suggest you do. I find it interesting that not only was this She Read Book Blog's first Agatha Raisin book, but also she felt she understood the characters and their motivation enough to read it as a standalone, especially being the 34th in a long-running series. This is certainly not my first Agatha Raisin rodeo, but even though I have read a considerable number of the books that came before it, I still wanted to go into it open-minded. I want to read the book before I start checking out what other people think. Admittedly, this is not always the case. Sometimes I have finished a book and had my doubts about my own views, which is disappointing, especially when it comes to popular books that others in my book friend circle have absolutely loved, and I didn't. Did I read the book wrong? Did I miss something? Sometimes, of course, there can be nothing more entertaining than reading through a mass of reviews to see who did and didn't share your views. Sometimes a reviewer will pinpoint something that niggled at me from the moment I opened the book, but for some reason couldn't put my finger on. You know that feeling, something doesn't feel quite right, but you're struggling to identify it. That's what I love about reading through reviews, even if I don't agree with everything that's being said at the time. As I always say though, everyone is different and when I pick up a book, I'm not necessarily looking for the same thing as the next reader. The author could be much loved for them or someone they have only heard good things about, while I may be reading it for no other reason than it's been sitting on my bookcase for literal years. And believe me when I say there are some books on my bookcase that have been there unread for more than a decade. Actually, I think one of them's about 15 years. As none of us is a mind reader, right? Is anyone a mind reader out there? It's impossible to truly know what a reviewer was thinking when they were reading that book, what their motivation for choosing it was or what mood they were in when they turned to the final page, if they actually got that far. Some reviews, it seems, are written by people who had similar thoughts. But as anyone who has been part of a book club could tell you, this happens often. If one person notices a plot hole, then the chances are others will too. However, I will always advise that you take any and every review with a generous pinch of salt. I am always happy to give book recommendations, as are most avid readers, but like everything, they are very personal. So if you've got limited time, think about the books you've read and already enjoyed. That's the first step to finding a book you'll love. There is no guarantee that any book you're recommended is going to be a top 10 read, but sometimes you just have to take a chance. Anyway, now I've told you about other people's views, let's get down to it. Here are my thoughts on Agatha Raisin Dead on Target by MC Beaton, written with R.W. Green. Completely spoiler-free and 100% honest. Did I like the book? If you've listened to my previous Agatha Raisin reviews, which I will link below, you'll know that I am not always 100% happy with the way that the characters come across in the books, specifically the later ones. There have been times when I have been incredibly tempted to abandon the series and only reread the earlier ones if I need to revisit Carsley. However, my faith in Agatha was actually restored with Dead on Target. I'm not sure if it was the contributions of a new writer or just that I had taken a short break from the stories, but the Agatha I read in this book was like a breath of fresh air, and it was lovely. While some of the reviewers who gave the book a lower score were not keen on the changes we see in Agatha's character, I found that they made her a more likeable person. Gone, thank goodness, was the bitter, angry, jealous and downright awful woman who was constantly bemoaning the fact that she was getting older and other younger women were gaining the attention of men their age. 
She had her moments, granted. There was a second where Charles Fraith was entertaining a young blonde, and I had a brief moment of dread when it appeared that the possessive and jealous crone had returned. But she was soon gone, and Agatha was back on track. I really did breathe a sigh of relief. I found this development to be a refreshing one because she had become so unbearable that I found myself loathing this literary creation I originally admired. In a previous episode, I believe I mentioned that I didn't like the woman Agatha had become and I honestly feared when I started this book that this is the woman I was going to find. I guess part of my problem with the bitter and jealous harpy is related to the fact that I am soon to turn 50 myself and for some reason I felt as though the constant reference to Agatha's age, her looks and her jealousy at the youth of others was a nod to women of a certain age and their feelings about younger women in general who were just starting out. Agatha has had several successful careers, she has friends, has a rather busy love life and has no reason to look at a younger woman and say it's not fair that this is what it felt like as though she was constantly doing in previous books frustrated and angered me to the point where I nearly gave up on her altogether. There were moments when I knew without a shadow of a doubt I was not reading an MC Beaton novel but being honest here I was actually happy about that. R.W. Green has brought something fresh to Agatha and in doing so has made her into a character I am again happy to know. Another element of the novel that some big Agatha Raisin fans weren't happy with was the lack of subplots. Hey, I'm not going to question it, I like a good subplot and I found that this book had enough of them that the main storyline didn't get obscured but it wasn't just one tone. We had the love story between Agatha and John which developed beautifully. As someone who has admittedly missed the last few books in the series because she was put off by some of the previous convoluted and unnecessary plots, I wasn't actually aware of John but I liked him when I met him. There were a few additional cases that Agatha and her fellow investigators, including Tony, had to solve, such as the possibly unfaithful husband and the missing llama. That was actually a really cute addition, though I don't think Agatha liked it spitting at her. However, none of these smaller cases took away from the core plot of the book. Who murdered Sir Godfrey and why? Carsley is a little bit like Cabot Cove in my mind. And as an aside, how can anyone possibly think that they can make a Murder, She Wrote film without Angela Lansbury? Has anyone else seen that and is anyone else as upset and annoyed as I am? The Village has a cast of regulars, Charles Fraith, Margaret Bloxby, James, Tony, Roy, Bill Wong and DCI Wilkes. We can't forget him even though he doesn't like her. And then we have the introduction of new residents who have always been there, but they are on the periphery. These tend to include the unfortunate victim and their family, and most of the suspects. Though, of course, that is not always the case. And I say this as I sadly remember the vicious vet and his second victim, poor Mrs. Josephs. I hate to say it, and I know that those who don't like the change will probably come for me with metaphorical pitchforks, but I like this new Agatha. I enjoy the fact that the plots feel less messy, and that as a reader I am not having to constantly pause and unravel the confusion that existed in books like There Goes the Bride, which I genuinely didn't enjoy. I feel as though Agatha has turned a corner and accepted who she is and the fact that she is no longer a sprightly 20-something. She has grown into the woman she always had the potential to be, an, an attractive, intelligent 50-something who still turns men's heads and still has a great deal to offer. She's got Charlie Fraith in a tiz still, her ex-husband seems to want her back and she's involved with a handsome policeman in John. Dead on Target had all the elements of a cosy mystery that make it the perfect Sunday afternoon read. With a like and with a likable main character and lead investigator, I think that this book had a winning combination. Was the book simple? Yes, it was. Was this book more enjoyable because it was simple? I personally think so. 
Without all the additional subplots, complicated rivalries and unnecessary secondary and tertiary cases that just added more confusion and convolution to the story, I was able to read this book without constantly having to refer back to something, which if anyone else uses the platform knows, that's not easy within the NetGalley reader. I'm not going to give away the killer because that would negate your need to read the book, but I didn't guess who it was, though I had some idea of the motive, and that is, for me at least, the perfect cosy crime novel. Will I read anything further in the Agatha Raisin series? I keep on saying that this is it, this is the last book I'm going to read in this series, but every once in a while something brings me back, whether it's hope that the character has improved or the fact that I just need something comforting and comfortable, which is the case at the moment, life is stressful. Whatever my reasons, I am probably going to read the next one. I like this new Agatha, I enjoyed this book, and I welcome the next story in her life. I also love to revisit the imagined beautiful and small English village life that is Carsley. If you're looking for something like this, or you loved this and want something else, then try these. I have a full listening list of cosy crime and I will post that in the notes below this episode. But if you're looking to read some cosy crime, then there are a few authors you really can't go wrong with. Agatha Christie. She will always be the queen of crime for me and I think that any book by her is a great place to begin your journey or end it. For me, Hercule Poirot is her best creation, but Miss Jane Marple and her life in St Mary Mead is probably closest to Carsley and Agatha Raisin. I recently went and saw A Haunting in Venice at the cinema, and though it bears very little resemblance to the book which inspired it, Halloween Party, it is actually a good Poirot novel and a great place to begin, as are Evil Under the Sun, Murder on the Orient Express, The Mysterious Affair at Styles and Peril at End House. Of course, if you want to read Miss Marple, you've got fantastic books such as A Murder is Announced, The Murder at the Vicarage, The Body in the Library, and The 450 from Paddington, which is slightly different to the others in that though it's a locked room mystery in many ways, it takes place while moving. Moving away from the classics, we have someone who clearly was inspired by them, in Anthony Horowitz with his two books, Within a Book Mysteries, Magpie Murders and Moonflower Murders, both of which I enjoyed, but I really do need to reread. If you, like me, enjoy Death in Paradise and we're going away again from the more classic, then take a trip to Marlowe with The Marlowe Murder Club and Death Comes to Marlowe by Robert Thorogood. Though I'm not a huge fan, I do know a lot of people love Richard Osman and the most recent addition to his Thursday Murder Club series, the fourth book in that series, was released in September and that is The Last Devil to Die. I can't believe we're in officially in autumn, headed quickly into winter, though actually you can't really tell by the weather because we're getting a, I'd say a second summer, but this is probably our first summer and yes, it is October. Where did that summer go? I am now a whole month into my book buying ban and though a lot of books I want have been released, I have been disciplined and not purchased anything. So there's a little round of applause for me there. Please do it. (laughs) I can't applaud myself. I have managed to read my way through nine books on my TBR. And admittedly, this was a bit of a disappointment, but a lot has been happening that has distracted me from my plans. So it can't be helped. Any progress is something. I finally managed to read through the last half of A Court of Mist and Fury and have determined that the series is, sadly, not one I will be continuing with. This does mean that I will be unhauling a complete matched set of books, but I know that someone somewhere will love them and that's all you can hope for when it comes to books that you don't enjoy. As we establish 
every single week. Not every book is for everybody. And on this occasion, that's what's happened. I have determined that I am actually going to be reducing or trying to reduce my TBR to 60 books before I start adding new tomes to the shelves, which means there is a way to go. In fact, I think 27 books, but I am confident I am not going to get waylaid that much, though Iron Flame is released at the beginning of November and I am not going to be putting off reading that longer than a day because I do not want to see any spoilers and I also want to get an episode out on that one relatively quickly. I continue to put together a list of books that I would like to purchase when my ban is over, at which point I am also likely to be doing a bit of an unhaul. I will be setting up a vintage store for some of the books I am going to be reducing from my shelves, as there are a few special editions on that list already. I am also putting together a list of books that I want to buy for myself, when this ban is over, as I have some beautiful empty shelves to fill. So if you have any book recommendations, perhaps a new author or a new genre you think I should add to my list, go for it. Please email me at beingbookishpod at gmail.com or DM me on Instagram and I will be sure to check it out. Don't forget, If you want to hear about new releases and other books I've read and keep up with my reviews, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website, beingbookish.co.uk. The first one of the autumn went out this week. So if you missed it, check the link in the episode notes. It's going to be sent out once a fortnight from now on and will contain links to past episodes, book reviews and other news. Well, that's it for this week and thank you so much for listening. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family and please post a star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any of the other podcatchers where you listen. You can follow me on Instagram and threads as being bookish pod, on TikTok as being bookish reviews, though I've been absent there of late because life has just been manic and on X which even the emails still subtitle as formerly Twitter as being underscore bookish. Or you can check out my website for the podcast back catalogue and full written spoiler free book reviews at beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I've got a lot to get ready for next week. I've already got the book planned, but I've got another few books I really need to get read. So until next time, this is me saying farewell. Farewell.